Uh, welcome everyone, thanks for coming to my talk. Um, just a quick introduction, so my name is Nathan, I work at Red Hat as part of the Platform Tools team. Uh, we work on Red Hat Enterprise Linux predominantly and not much else. Go ahead. Yeah, this is mic for the recording, it's not for, so I'll try to talk up. Is that any better? <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yeah? Okay, I'll try. <laughs> Uh, so, as I was saying, I work in platform tools, work on Red Hat Enterprise Linux predominantly, uh, and Fedora a fair bit. Um, so, our team is responsible for things like uh, GCC, glibc, uh, these kind of very low-level tools and libraries are all part of what we look after for, for Red Hat. Um, so, my talk today is going to be about um, machine learning and system performance analysis and sort of the, the meeting of these two different worlds uh, for a, a little tool that I've been working on as a, a bit of a project. Um, so yeah, let's get into that. Um, so a quick overview of the goals, and I'll, I'll explain to you what PCP is if you haven't come across it before, and how we in this project have used machine learning to uh, model the system. Um, but before we go into that, I'll just talk a bit about what we're trying to do with this treetop idea. Um, so the, the main idea is to do uh, augmented system analysis. Uh, so we don't want to try to solve performance analysis problems without a human being involved. The, the goal is really to uh, help the, the person who's trying to analyze the system do a better job of analyzing that system. Um, so the initial focus is PCP's domain. So PCP Performance Copilot is all about sampling of performance metrics predominantly. Uh, so we do use some other techniques, but predominantly it's a sampling based system uh, and regularly samples. So it's a system you use to do recording of activity on, on a system of all sorts of, of activity. And I'll talk a little bit more about uh, how it works. Uh, if you've not come across PCP before, you're probably familiar with other similar systems uh, like OpenTelemetry, um, Prometheus, these kinds of systems. This is the, the space that, that PCP is played in. PCP is a very old project. It's been around for 25 to 30 years. Um, yeah. Um, so some of the interesting aspects of... Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Sure, sure, sorry. <laughs> um, so, no problem. <laughs> um, so yeah, we, we have a, a very high cardinality problem with PCP that we're dealing with. So if you think about your systems that you're looking at, we have uh, probably more metrics than you realize. Uh, so the kernel, Linux kernel while it's running, or Windows kernel, these things keep thousands and thousands of metrics all the time that they're constantly updating while they're running. Uh, and we very rarely would look at all of them. Um, at once. And so this is kind of the space that we want machine learning to start getting involved with uh, to help us direct our investigation a bit more so that if there are things happening on the system that might be important to know about, then we want to be proactively made aware of that in, in an investigation. Um. Um, so yeah, our, our focus on with PCP is always to be as lightweight as we can. So these are, are tools that tend to be running all the time on, on production systems. So um, all of PCP, for example, or pretty much all of it is written in C. And these are like, low-level uh, demons that are running all the time uh, as efficiently as they can. Um, so yeah, and in this project we wanted to explore different approaches. So this tool that I'll be talking about is different to any other tool that you've probably come across before. So keep that in mind when you, you see what it looks like. It looks a little bit different to, to things like Top and Grafana or other, other things you might be used to. Um, and I wanted to incorporate anomalies. As anyone who's done performance analysis for real for, for any amount of time will know that anomal anomalous behavior is often something that is a, a sign of a performance problem that you might want to know more about. So. Uh, this incorporates that uh, fundamentally from the start. Um, so just backing up a step, I'll talk about the two aspects of the problem that we have here. Um, so I'll talk a, bit, a little bit about PCP. I've talked at a high level, but this is a bit more of a drill down. Uh, so PCP is a lightweight sampling system, a system-wide system, much like uh, Prometheus and its endpoint kind of design. 
Uh, PCP allows performance data from anywhere in your system. So the kernel, uh, databases, system services, any kind of performance data can become part of what is available to you as metrics in PCP. Um, so yeah, we have these, these different domains. In PCP, things are called domains, and we have domain agents that are making those metrics available from different domains, and you can add new domains, dom domain agents as you need to, to add more metrics into the system. Uh, the focus is on sampling. It's a, a lightweight system, as I mentioned before. Um, and yeah, there are, there are many, many thousands of metrics and tens to hundreds of thousands of different values. So, uh, and this is uh, time series data. Uh, from PCP, so and that kind of leads into the AI side of things. So if you um, know much about AI, there, there's several different types of machine learning uh, that this system uses internally. Uh, the first is uh, uh, supervised machine learning. It's probably the main um, the main form of machine learning that we're using uh, in this kind of system. If you know machine learning, which you probably do, being at the, the AI track. Uh, we use um, like a, a target variable that we're trying to predict, and then we use all of the other variables that we have at our disposal to try and model the system and try to predict that. And that can be all sorts of different uh, things that we're trying to predict. We might be trying to classify something. We might be trying to do a like a real valued prediction um, or a, a, a regression problem. So these are called regression and classification. Uh, in the performance space, uh, we're typically trying to uh, predict uh, a value that's, that's going to, to happen, uh, and that makes this a, a regression problem, typically. Um, so there's a little known, a relatively little known area in AI called explainable AI, uh, and that actually forms a big part of this project. So the goal here isn't really the, the traditional uh, supervised learning thing where we're trying to predict something. That, that's part of it. But what we really want to do is build a model of the system that explains what's happening in the system and then use explainability to try and explain to the person who's using the system exactly what's happening inside the system or the important areas that they need to look. Uh, and I'll go a bit more about that. Um, and yeah, I mentioned before we want to in incorporate anomaly detection because that's a, a very important activity typically when we do um, performance analysis. So if there are anomalous behaviors that we can pick up in any of the metrics, then we want to be aware of those things and, and build that into the model. So if that can help to make a, a better explanation of what's happening on the system, then that's something we want to make available. Uh, so, and there's another even lesser known uh, area of, of research in the AI world called explainable anomaly detection, or XID. Uh, and we use uh, both of these explainable AI techniques uh, in this system. Um, and finally, to bring it all together, we use uh, on ensemble models. So an, an ensemble model is a model that is using different kinds of models to achieve it, its goals. Um, so I didn't really talk about gradient boosting. Um, so we use in this system, uh, so we evaluated lots and lots of different types of AI models and algorithms. Uh, and gradient boosted trees um, for this kind of data proved to be very, very effective. So they are they're very lightweight and uh, very, very accurate for this kind of data. So the sorts of data we have here, we, you can consider as like tabular data. So uh, tabular time series data. So if you think of a spreadsheet, um, sort of going across in the columns of your spreadsheet, you might have all the different metrics that you have on your system, like literally thousands and thousands of metrics. So things like the load average, uh, number of bytes across ne different network interfaces, uh, packets going across network interface, amounts of memory that have been used, um, traffic within a database, what your transaction rate is, how much memory is used within different parts of the database. There's literally thousands and thousands of variables that could be potentially important to what you're trying to understand. Um, so yeah, uh, so yeah, so that's the 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 depth part. And then if you think of the spreadsheet, you've got all these columns, which are all your metrics, and then your rows are each individual sample over time. So you might look at, make a sample of all those values once, uh, and timestamp it, and then those form your rows of your, your spreadsheet. And that's the, the data set that we're going to be using for machine learning and to try to produce models that understand as best they can what's, what's happening on the system. 
Uh, you may have come across this kind of picture from Brendan Gregg. Uh, and this is kind of a, just another way to look at that same problem that I was just talking about. Um, so this is Brendan's set of performance tools that he will uh, turn to when he has performance problems. Um, so in the box, uh, the, the colored box towards the middle, upper, upper left, is all the different components of a single machine. Uh, and then all the different tools that you might want to use to look at different parts of the system. Uh, so uh, this is great. And if you're an expert like Brendan and you have many, many years of experience, you know exactly how all these tools work. Um, each of these tools will potentially be using hundreds of different metrics and values inside of that tool that it's then condensing and reporting to you. Uh, a lot of them are only live tools, so you, you get to run them once on the system and then you observe the value. So if you, if you don't know what you're looking for, uh, you've got a lot of tools to run uh, that potentially is problematic. So what we really want to do is try and condense that down and give people an, an idea. Like if you're looking at a certain thing, like you're trying to understand database performance, we want to direct you in ways, into areas that you probably should be looking a bit more. Um. Okay, so, so this is a very, very high level algorithm. So I'll, I'll talk about this and then I'll dive into it in much more detail. So, uh, and this is more the, the supervised learning part of it I'll talk about first. Uh, and this is really a, a description of a general um, supervised learning. Uh, so the approach that we have here is the human analyst tells the, the system, this is the area I'm looking at. It might be I'm interested in understanding my application response time. I might be interested in understanding disk latency. I might be trying to understand uh, packet transfer rates and what's causing them to go the speed that they currently are going. Uh, so you provide that to the system and that becomes the target variable. Uh, you, you can potentially provide multiple different targets and we can try and uh, model the system with with multiple targets at once. But for simplicity's sake, let's just take a single uh, example. Uh, let's say we're looking at a database and we're trying to understand the, the transaction rate that's going through that database and what factors are affecting that. Um, I, I should, little aside, I put a note there, there's ambiguous terminology here. So between the performance world, performance analysis world, uh, we use the term metrics all over the place to mean things that are metrics about the system. But in the machine learning world, metrics tend to be things, uh, attributes of the model. So you're looking at the performance of the actual model. So uh, just be aware that there may be places where I, I talk about metrics. I'm typically talking about uh, performance metrics in this talk and not so much about model performance, although I'll talk about that as well. Um, so we've selected our target. Uh, we have the data set that I was talking about. If you think about that spreadsheet idea in your head, we don't actually have a spreadsheet. It's, it's all just being sampled on the machine, potentially, while it's running. Uh, and that forms our data set. So we look at the most recent history, maybe the last couple of hours it would be a common amount of time. If we're sampling every 10 seconds, we pretty quickly build up a data set that we can train and try to understand what's happening on the system based on, on that data set. Um, yeah, and, and so in order to do this training, we, uh, we want to withhold the most recent observation. So the most recent observation will have the value that we're trying to understand. Let's say it's that, that data sp database transaction rate. So we, we keep that and all of the other information from the most recent sample, like right now, typically. And then we look back at the last two, two hours in the lead up to that and, and train our model to try and make a prediction of what we've just observed without presenting what we've just observed to the model. Uh, so, and that way we can tell whether the, the data that we've looked at in the past little while is a good representation and is it has enough information that we can make an accurate prediction of what we think is, is about to happen or has just happened. Um, yeah, I mentioned these are time series data. Um, so yeah, there's, there's aspects of dealing with time series data when you're, you're training models where you need to be careful uh, how you present that data to the model to train from. You can't just pass it in willy-nilly and um, like randomly. It needs to be presented in the sequence uh, that, that it happened in. Uh, and the final step is that we make a prediction. And if the prediction looks like it it has some knowledge about the system, like it's an accurate prediction of what the database response time happens to be. 
uh, then we can look at, interrogate the model and ask it, okay, so you've come up with this value, it looks pretty good, how did you get that value? And so you can then look at all the other metrics on the system, the features of the, that we use to train the model, and uh, certain models, like boosted trees, can tell you exactly which, which features they use to make that prediction. So that's, that's the high level. Um, so this is a diagram, just ignore the top part for now, we'll come back to this in a minute. I just want to draw your attention to the bottom five, uh, the, the five columns that run across the diagram and just show th there's kind of a pipeline that we go through in producing this model. So we start out with our data source, which is uh, either live performance data or recent, recent history. Uh, it could also be ancient history that we, we may have been sent uh, an archive of performance data from, from someone, that perhaps a, a customer that our support organization needs to look at and understand and try to help the, the customer explain what's, what's happening. Uh, so that's our, our source of that, that data set. Uh, then we do some initial data preparation and we move across from left to right, uh, uh, do some feature engineering, I'll talk about that, and then train the model, make the predictions as I was saying, uh, and come up with an explanation for, for what the most important contributing factors are. Um, so, yeah, a little bit more about the training step, uh, just before the training step, so preparing the data that we'll use for training. This is uh, a very important part of any machine learning exercise, as, as you may know. Um, quality data in results in, in better models. Um, so we're fortunate in this, this kind of project and in the analysis, system analysis space that we have a, a wealth of data that we can draw on to uh, to try to understand the system. It's, it's typically not biased data as well. There's, there's no problem usually with um, sharing that data. Uh, there's no very little personal information. So lots of machine learning situations. You need to be very careful about your data. In this case, we're, we're dealing with data that's come from the machine. So it's, it's kind of a, a blessing in that way. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is feature reduction. So we want to find features that are not going to be contributing to the, the quality of the model that we produce and just start getting rid of those pretty quickly if we can because that makes the model training process faster uh, and will give us a better, better model in the end if we can get rid of noise from, from our data set. Uh, so we're going to select metrics and these are performance metrics that we're going to exclude. Uh, and it uses a couple of techniques. So the, the simplest is just variance. So if a value doesn't change very much at all for the entire time, or, or not at all, then we can just discard that because it's not going to be used to, uh, in the, the actual model that's, that's produced in the end. Uh, it has no value to the, to the training process, so we can get rid of some that way. Uh, and then there's another concept um, which is a little bit like correlation, if you've come across that before, but it's not correlation, um, called mutual information. This is a, a mathematical concept that tries to express causality between two independent variables. Um, so what we're doing I here is we take our target variable uh, and then we compare it to each of the other features. Uh, and if there's any indication that there might be some causal relationship between those two things, uh, then we'll want to keep that, that feature. But if there's very, very low causality potential, then potentially we can drop off uh, some of those features. Uh, so those two things we use to, to cull our initial data set. Uh, and then the second step here is feature engineering. So we have now some set of metrics that we're interested in, and we can do certain things to try and make better models. Uh, and here's a couple of examples that we've come up with. Uh, we can do time-based feature engineering. We have a timestamp for, for every data sample that we've taken. Uh, so we can say, well, this is on the hour. So some performance problems are time-based. So maybe there's a backup that goes off a certain time or something that happens from a cron job on the hour or every five minutes or something like that. So we can make a feature out of that and say, this time sample occurred on that five-minute boundary, that kind of thing. Uh, and then the, the other aspects of feature engineering that we're using is this uh, anomaly detection concept. So uh, in, I'm not sure another slide about this, no. Um, so the anomaly detection that we, we use here, there's lots and lots of different algorithms for anomaly detection that you can use. So this is an unsupervised learning problem. 
Uh, in this system, I ended up using, I, I wanted to do multivariate anomaly detection. So the different models have different strengths and weaknesses or the different algorithms. Um, and so I've ended up choosing to use uh, this uh, isolation forest mechanism for, for multivariate anomaly detection. So that a diagram there is just showing you several different kinds of anomaly detection that we might want to pick up on while we're doing uh, this analysis. Um, and yeah, so then the, the final challenge here is how do you get those anomalies that you've detected back into the feature set that you're using to train the, the main supervised learning model? Um, and in order to do that, we use uh, a mechanism called DIFI, which actually I think I talk about in a coming up slide. So I might just skip ahead to this one. Uh, so I'll just keep talking about the anomaly detection, the very last point there while I'm on it. Um, this depth-based isolation forest feature so when we build trees to, to do our machine learning uh, modeling, uh, there are some certain trees, if you build them a certain way, they have properties that you can look at the tree and find data points that are kind of isolated and off to the side in various parts of the tree. And that has been shown to give a strong indication that those are kind of anomalous data points. Uh, if we've detected that, then we can try and get a measure. So this Diffie system gives us a measure of just how much different though those anomalies are to the rest of the samples in the set and they also it also gives us a breakdown of which of the features are contributing to that anomaly so it gives us a value how big this anomaly is and which features are causing that so we can then take those that information and feed it back into the data set that we're going to train the main supervised learning model from um, so yeah, that's the anomaly detection part. Um, I didn't really talk about the, the way the, the primary model is trained. So this is the supervised part. Uh, so I mentioned we withhold the most recent sample and that's what we're going to try to predict. Uh, we then, for the rest of the data that we have, so let's say it's two hours previously, we then split that up into um, uh, using this time series split mechanism of uh, cross-validation split it up into a training and validation set and we can train a model uh, over several epochs as we move through that two hours uh, and using the, the validation to not overfit that model as we go. Um, and yeah, we, we focus on just like a small amount of data, like two hours is a pretty good indicator of what's happening on the system right now and that helps us to, to keep focused on the problem as it is, not the problem as it was. Uh, and avoiding these seasonality issues with long-term long trends that gets taken out of the picture. Um, a final little point there, the second last one from the bottom, uh, predicting and explaining. So uh, I think I mentioned that tree-based models in particular have very good explainability characteristics. So you can always, once you've created a model, interrogate it and say, well, how did you come up with that answer? And it will tell you which parts of the data set it used. Uh, and so we use that extensively in this system. All right, so this is uh, that original diagram again. Just want to go back to that and make sure we've covered everything off. So moving left to right, we, we sample our data. We build up this two-hour data set that we're going to use. We do some uh, interesting stuff for performance data. So sometimes we need to do rate conversion for metrics. So if it's a counter, it's not really useful to look at the raw value of a counter. We need to look at how that counter value is changing over time. Uh, and then we do the feature engineering steps that I mentioned, and that produces the input data set for, for training uh, and the unsupervised learning part. And the final step, we, we make a prediction of what the current um, sample is that we're, we're trying to explain. Uh, and if we can, if we're happy with the uh, accuracy of that prediction, then we can look into the explanation that the, the model is providing us as to why that might be that way. And then we can present that in a display. So I've got this um, simple example here. So this is just the very first version of this tool. It's a pretty simple sort of console tool. You can see it sort of updates a bit like a, a top kind of tool. Uh, in the top left corner, we've got information about the, the training process. So it's not super interesting other than to point out things like the, the sampling time so, and how many features we're looking at here. Um, and so, yeah, the training for tree-based models is, is very quick. Uh, and yeah, we're, we're getting pretty good accuracy here. So we might want to look down in the, the second half of the display. 
Um, and the second part is showing uh, metrics. So this, this hierarchical namespace of metrics is uh, just all of the different metrics that might be on your system. Um, so we, in this example, I said, OK, I'm trying to understand the transaction rate on my SQL Server database, uh, build a model that tries to explain that. And then over time, uh, we can see it update, and it pulls out the most important metrics from your, your whole set of available metrics and shows you like, how, how much of a contribution it, it's thinking each of those are making. Um, so yeah, you see the, the mutual information uh, column there showing you just how closely related they are. So we can see the, the disk read rate on the E drive there is particularly uh, closely related to the transaction rate. Uh, but we also see all sorts of interesting activity in all sorts of p places within SQL Server. So latches are a form of locking that happens within SQL Server. So that wait time is clearly in that preceding two hours, having a big impact on, on the, the transaction rate that we're able to push through. Um, so you can see how it's coming up with so, sort of novel things that you might not have thought of to look at, and, and it comes up with this very quickly. So the, the general idea at the end of the day will be to have a, a tool that you can run just like Top or any other tool, and it will be able to look across your entire system and come up with ideas and explanations for activity that you, you might want to look at. Uh, so yeah, last little bit and before I run out of time. So current status is, uh, so we've been looking at production incidents that we have data sets for. So currently we have at least three major production incidents that we have data sets for. Uh, and we evaluate the models on those just to check that the system is working. Uh, so when you actually use this uh, independently, once it's, uh, uh, once it's available, um, it, it has no knowledge of previous systems. So it's not like a, a deep learning kind of model where you might be fine tuning or uh, using embeddings from some other system. Everything that it does is based on the activity and the metrics that are on your current system that you're trying to, to look at. So it has no uh, bias from other systems or anything like that. It literally is just looking at your system. And thankfully, the, the training process is so fast that we can uh, come up with some good answers pretty quickly. Uh, based on that. Um, so yeah, we've gone through suitability uh, evaluation, so producing metrics and how all these different algorithms for machine learning work and, and how they perform and which ones are, are well suited. Uh, and we have this proof of concept. So the next step is to determine which of the gradient booster trees, like the gradient booster tree algorithms are, are clearly like streets ahead of any of the other algorithms that are available. And there are many, many machine learning algorithms that we, we've looked at and that you can use. So we'll keep focusing on these three uh, and pick one eventually that we'll use. Uh, that user interface, which I showed updating before, is pretty clunky. Uh, there's, there's lots and lots that we can do to do a better job there. Uh, so we'll make it in from, it's currently just a notebook, uh, move into, into a, a proper command line tool that we can ship and make available to people to use. Uh, and we'll switch to being able to do live streaming of values as well. So you'll have your recorded data from PCP that you start training from, and then that data set will be, form a rolling window as you, you continue running the tool, and you just keep looking back at the last two hours for your, for your training. And that, oh, so last thought, so it's, yeah, so it's probably about halfway through this project at the moment. Um, I, I anticipate um, making the code available in the next few months. Um, and yeah, once it's built into a proper tool, it's very e m much easier to use. Uh, and we'll probably build APIs and things like that that uh, you could build on top of. Um, I just wanted to point out the this observation bias uh, idea. So I, I mentioned that it's not looking at things that um, it thinks are a good idea. Uh, so one of the common problems in performance analysis is people know the tools. Like you, you, if you remember from Brendan's picture at the, the start, people might know some number of those tools. Uh, and they'll focus on those tools that they know about, because that's, that's what you know about. So you look where you know, but the problem might not be there. So you, you may be looking in the wrong place. It may be a SQL Server problem, and we're using Brendan's diagram to try and understand the system. We're never going to solve the problem that way because we've, we've biased our thinking because of the tools that we know. So this kind of frees, that, frees us up from that by looking at the entire system all at once and finding the things that we really need to focus in on. 
Um, so yeah, if you've not heard of the street light effect before, there's a, a, a URL there you can have a look at. Um, and that's where that picture came from. And yeah, so that's pretty much the talk. So it's a, a new kind of performance tool that, that's quite different to anything else that you might have seen before. And so that user interface uh, is quite different uh, and has a long way to go before it's, it's particularly usable. Um, but that's just its very early state that I, I've showed there. And yeah, it's definitely not a replacement for existing tools. It's something that you might want to add to your to toolkit. And that is it. Thank you. Any questions? Did you hear me at the back? <laughs> You did? Barely. No problem. I'll talk to you later. <laughs> Come and grab me. <laughs> Any questions? Absolutely. Yeah, it's, so the question is, uh, I think, have we found things already that were surprising in, in the development of the system? Uh, absolutely we have. So uh, several, <laughs> um, several of, like, all, all of the data sets that we have are from known production incidents that happened many years ago. So one of the advantages of PCP is that the data format that's on disk is sort of holy to us. We, we never break it. So you can have archives going back many, many years that we can still replay and use to assess this tool today. So we can look back at things that happened. So in that SQL Server example I gave, that happened in 2009. That, that recording was from then. And we were finding all sorts of things in there that we just had no idea had happened on that system <laughs> at that time. Uh, so yeah, the three examples that we're looking at were, were a SQL Server data set, a Linux machine which was running an application server, so a Java application, and a, a storage system, so a network attached storage device. Uh, and yeah, in all three cases, so in, uh, each of them had a different kind of production incident. And so we kind of knew at certain times in the day something was going to go down and we, we were looking for that to be shown. Uh, absolutely, like if we couldn't find the problems that we knew were there, then we've wasted our time. But absolutely we did. And we found all sorts of other things. So there are um, all sorts of like activity somewhere in the virtual memory, virtual memory subsystem in the kernel, something nobody had ever thought to look at. There was stuff that was happening down there in huge page land that was really interesting and just not known at the time. So, <laughs> Go ahead. No. No, no change. Uh, so the question is, does this require any um, change to the PCP archive format? No. So the PCP archive format has uh, all of the metric metadata that you might need to do an analysis offsite. Uh, and yeah, there's, there's no change required for this. So that, we were fortunate it was designed quite well 30 years ago when, when the system was created. And it has all of the names of all the metrics, all of the metadata like the units and that sort of thing is kept captured in the archive. Uh, the timestamps, everything we need. So we can just keep replaying. So there's another question. Okay, I th I'll repeat you. So I think your question is, is there something here that will catch long-term trends like memory leaks over time? Um, yeah, so at the moment it's focused on just the two hour window, as I was saying. So if there's a, a pattern of activity that goes for longer than two hours, it's not going to pick it up. It will pick up small trends that are, uh, if that's important to what you're looking for, right? So if you're looking at disk latency, then the long-term trend of, of the memory footprint of the program maybe isn't going to have an impact. But if you set your target metric to be a particular processor's memory utilization, then it may well pick up uh, things that are, are related to that and activity that's happening in the program that might be related to causing that memory leak. Yeah. Any other questions? Nope. All right, thanks everyone.